there's a powder keg that that exists right now in Europe. Bottom line is no chance it would be enforced. I don't know how the U.S. publicly would state that, but it's going to be a problem in Europe. When they start shaming everybody, the Democrats, and they start saying, oh, you're going to give us Trump. The answer to them is you did this. You did this. But where are all the big CNN stars of the world who every day tweet, this is how many days that Evan Gershkovich has been in prison. Where are they when 110 of your colleagues have been murdered? murdered with American bombs. One moment of anyone's day, you should just stop, read something about what the conditions were like even on October 6th in Gaza and ask yourself, what would my life be like? What kind of person would you be? All right, Jeremy Scale, ladies and gentlemen. Hello, uh, first time caller, long time fan. Same here. Um, I'm very, um, okay, you don't mean that. that. You don't have to say that, don't worry. I said on Twitter that my parents love your show. Um, that was also, I assume, fake news. My mom is watching right now, and I'm, oh. I, it's totally, totally, I told her not to click on anything. Okay, yeah, no, the, don't, don't is do that. Is this better? I made it louder. Yeah, it is better, for sure. Um, all right. All right, so some things happened uh, this, uh, this past day. Uh, the, the case against Israel started, case being genocide. And uh, you've covered it. You wrote an article on The Intercept on, uh, on the matter. And I wanted to talk to you about it. Uh, there's obviously some other stuff that we could talk about, but I think that it's important. And, uh, you know, uh, the, the uh, overarching goals here are obviously uh, South Africa laying out the case that I think they did a pretty good job with uh, on, on why Israel is uh, committing acts of uh, genocide upon the Palestinian population, something that they've basically brought about themselves. So there are two different things I want to ask you. One, what is the difference between the International Court of Justice versus the ICC, the International Criminal Court? Let's start there. I mean, on a political level, the International Criminal Court has always sort of been viewed as a U.S.-dominated tool. Um, and much, for much of its history, it operated in an ad hoc manner. So you had uh, the war in Yugoslavia in the 1990s. So the, the United States uh, advocated for setting up an ad hoc tribunal rather than um, implementing a permanent international criminal court. In fact, the United States does not recognize uh, the International Criminal Court as having jurisdiction over all countries. It prefers for nations in Africa primarily to be subjected to the jurisdiction of something that nonetheless is called an international criminal court. And in fact, both Democrats and Republicans alike throughout U.S. His history have undermined the U.S. actually fully accepting that an international court would have jurisdiction over the United States. One wild thing that's totally true, but a lot of people don't know about it, is that in 2002, George Bush signed into law a, a piece of legislation that had widespread bipartisan support call, uh, that, that came to be known as the Hague Invasion Act. Yeah. And what that, law, what that law says, and it's still on the books, by the way. Yep. Interestingly, Joe Biden voted against it. Um, but that law is still on the books. And what it says is that not only does the United States not recognize the International Criminal Court as having jurisdiction over the U.S. and its allies, but that if there is ever an attempt to prosecute any U.S. personnel or the personnel or of any— yeah, or, or extradite or bring any type, sort of proceedings at the International Criminal Court against U.S. personnel, not just soldiers, any U.S. personnel, or personnel of allies of the United States, that the president of the United States is authorized to initiate an invasion of the Netherlands to, to liberate any uh, U.S. personnel uh, being prosecuted or charged with um, war crimes. They've had so it come. The IC They've had it come. So the ICC is... is overwhelmingly a court that is used by powerful nations to prosecute the Yugoslavias and the Rwandas of the world. And the vast majority of the cases that have been prosecuted there um, have been against um, involving African nations. When we talk about the International Court of Justice, this is the official world court that was set up uh, by the United Nations um, in the aftermath of World War II. And the United States actually has been convicted at that court of terrorism. It was convicted in the early 1980s for the mining of the waters around Nicaragua when the United States was fueling the dirty wars um, in, in Central America. And the U.S. was actually convicted at the court. One tidbit of history, though, is that the chief, the president of the current tribunal that is hearing the genocide case uh, that South Africa brought against Israel. The, the, the current judge in that case, who is the, the head of it, is an American judge named Joan Donahue. 
Joan Don, so the Americans have the presidency of the court right now that mm-hmm. is hearing a genocide case against its dear friend, uh, Israel. So Joan Donahue, if people watched it today, you saw her. She was the one that was presiding over it. Um, she was one of the lawyers for the United States when they were convicted of terrorism at the World Court for mining the harbors in Nicaragua. And she now is the the, the president of that uh, tribunal. Now, having said that, the International Court of Justice is widely viewed as a much more neutral uh, sort of uh, force when it comes can I, to international Can I interject justice. here real quickly yeah, and ask ahead. you a question? You if I'm not mistaken, the Nicaragua court case also still had an American judge on it, obviously. Yeah. And the American judge actually ruled against the United States interests in that court case, as far as I remember. So, like, that is a unique so, so situation. What, yeah. Yeah. I'm I'm, th- I'm throwing that out there because, um, you know, I, I, I think that uh, certainly the United States would like to, uh, you know, assert its influence over any uh, judgment there. But that's not always how American lawyers operate. Not every single American, even though this judge uh, is close to Hillary Clinton, even though she uh, was one of the lawyers defending the United States in its own uh, case before the, the court, doesn't necessarily mean that she won't be fair. Um, but what we do know is that the Biden administration has already preemptively said that this case is without merit and has yeah. said that the charges of genocide are ludicrous and have no basis. Um, so they're already doing a sort of preemptive defense of Israel. But the United States is not in control of the International Court of Justice the way that it is able to assert its influence over the ICC. So um, now, having said that, even if this court rules that, so first of all, people should understand this. What South Africa is asking for right now in an urgent manner is not to convict Israel of genocide, not to even find that Israel is engaged in genocidal conduct. What South Africa is arguing is that there should be a trial of Israel for uh, genocide. And they walk through the genocide convention in meticulous detail. But what they're actually asking for is for the court to issue what they call provisional measures. What does that mean? It means that they're saying, if this court has jurisdiction, and if there is enough evidence to take it to trial, that the court should order the defendant, Israel, to halt its military operations. Because failure to do so, in the event that it's true that Israel is committing genocide, would mean that it it is now blood on the hands of the court for refusing to stop an ongoing criminal activity when they when they had the authority to do so. So a lot of people think like, oh, you know, Netanyahu's going to be on trial. That's not what this is about. What this is about right now is, is that South Africa, as a signatory to the Genocide Convention, has the right to bring a case. Any country could have done this that's yeah. a signatory to the convention. It's significant that South Africa brought it because of its history with apartheid um, and terrorism in, in its own country, an apartheid backed by the United States. It's also significant that the South Africans had um, a very uh, brilliant lawyer from Ireland, and Ireland has been very outspoken, perhaps more than any European country, um, in standing up for the Palestinians during this uh, this slaughter. So what, what the South Africans asked for today was for the court to issue provisional measures instructing Israel to cease its military operations in Gaza pending litigation on the question of whether or not Israel is committing genocide. Yeah. So and and today they uh, laid the facts out, which uh, are are so public and so broad. And one distinction here, if I'm not mistaken, is that the the ICC has the capacity to convict people, whereas the ICJ yes. is just for UN nations, and it is a it's a nation versus nation thing. This is why, for instance, you know, I mean, it's a, it's a no. I'm glad that you're that you're raising this point. So, for instance, many of the leaders in the former Yugoslavia stood trial as individuals, including um, heads of states. Slobodan Milosevic, the, the former president of Yugoslavia and then Serbia, uh, died during the course of his trial, actually, um, well, at yeah. The Hague. And, you know, Very famously. But what, what's, yeah, well, yeah, and you also had that thing where the guy took the, 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 it looked like he was taking a shot of whiskey, but he was actually poisoning himself and died. I mean, this happened also at the International Criminal Court. So the, yeah. it's a crazy scene there. But this is, so Israel is basically, their defense is basically going to amount to repeating October 7th, uh, like eight bazillion times, October 7th, October 7th. And one of the lawyers for uh, the South Africans, who actually was a, a rather old British lawyer, was tasked today at the court with sort of preempting some of Israel's arguments. And what he said was, Israel is going to seek to say that Hamas should actually be on trial here instead of Israel. 
But what this lawyer pointed out, he didn't make an emotional statement. He said, Hamas is not a nation state. Hamas is not a party to the genocide well, convention. They could. Israel could technically, if they wanted to, try to, I, I, from what I understand, they could technically go to the ICJ, but that would require them to recognize Palestine as a nation state, I think, with a tacit uh, recognition that like Palestinians have autonomy, and that goes against their overarching interest of dominating them. Am I not correct on that? There, there, there is that, but also there's, there's a radical oversimplification of what Hamas is that takes place in the international discourse. You, you have Hamas as a political entity, and then yeah. you have uh, the military wing of Hamas. And, you know, I'm not I'm not trying to to nitpick here, but facts actually matter. And Israel's entire narrative is that this is not a governing body. This is a terrorist actor. Yeah. Um, and, and so what the lawyers for South Africa said today was there are proper venues to prosecute the war crimes that Hamas may have committed, um, but this isn't it. And then went further and said... The United Nations recognizes that Gaza is still occupied territory. Israel disputes that and says, oh, we pulled out, we removed our settlements. What the United Nations has found repeatedly is that Gaza still constitutes an occupied territory because Israel is, in, is entirely in control of its land, its air, its sea, all uh, uh, basic necessities of life that come in and out of there. When, when Israel's defense minister said early on in this, you know, we're going to shut everything down, the electricity, the food, etc., he meant it because Israel knows how to do it because they have been doing it for a very long time. So, you know, while Israel is going to try to uh, make Hamas the defendant in this case, I don't think that that is going to fly even with the American judge. As much as the United States and the Biden administration constantly goes back to October 7th as being a justification for the mass killing of tens of thousands of people, the maiming of tens of thousands of people, the extraordinary level of death of children, the fact of the matter is, and the South African lawyer said this, retribution is is no uh, justification for genocide. You 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 yeah. can't wage a war of revenge. And if international law is going to matter, then facts are going to matter. And so Israel's entire defense that we have the right to do whatever we want because of October seventh actually is not consistent with any basic principles of international law. It's just it's just yeah. a fact. Yeah. Um. As the belligerent occupier, a case uh, it can't even be made. To, to a right to defense against uh, the people that you are uh, the belligerent occupier over as well. So there is the, the notion of like, I mean, I, this is my assessment of the situation is what I've been yeah. saying at least is like on October 7th, inside of the boundaries of what is known as Israel proper, yes, the Israeli occupying force, the Israeli defense force did have the right to defend its citizens like a like a police force would, right? Whereas everything beyond that, especially the the Gaza operations, would constitute as a as something outside of the bounds of of a right to defense that Israel does not have. It's it's a as a belligerent occupier. It, it doesn't. Well, also, you know, I mean, there, there, look, uh, if you, it, I, I, I find myself saying this when I argue with people. I mean, I heard you on the show earlier talking about conversations with normies. I mean, I also, I'm surrounded in my entire life by, by normies. My family, we're from the Midwest. I talk to people all the time. And the thing is, like, the, the way that this has been portrayed, for, the first narrative on this was that 1,400 civilians were killed. That was the first draft of history that was promoted by the Israelis about what happened on October 7th. Um, when you actually start to review the details, it's, mu it's much more complicated. We're talking about uh, just under 800 civilians that were documented to have been killed. We're talking about a couple hundred soldiers that were killed. Um, Hamas attacked a number of military installations. Certainly war crimes were committed that day, uh, yeah. without question. Um, you know, I, I, I think it's utterly uh, atrocious to take, uh, a, you know, old people, uh, babies. There, there was, you know, there was one 10-month-old uh, that was taken hostage. I mean, no one with a, with a heart and a brain would be defending that conduct. And no one with a heart and a brain should be defending the conduct that Israel engages in uh, regularly when it uh, arrests children, um, you know, and puts them in military tribunals. Um, so if we wanna talk about facts, then we need to understand which groups did what on October 7th? Because you had Hamas, you had Palestinian Islamic Jihad, and then you had um, what appeared to be independent actors that came in. Yeah. Um, you know, we, we then have to break down once once the siege was laid to the kibbutzes and to the music festival, what did the response of the Israelis look like? If you read the Israeli press, in many ways, it's much more uh, open and transparent about what actually happened on October 7th than the American press. There is a very serious discussion right now in Israel about how many Israelis were killed 
by the Israeli military yeah. when they responded to Hamas. And there, I mean, it's this is not conspiracy theory stuff. This is in mainstream Israeli newspapers. Why not? And my art. And my yeah, why you know why not Haaretz, um, you know I mean the, the major TV networks have been interviewing witnesses who describe the Israeli forces shelling it. You have a history in Israel uh, uh, of there's a number of doctrines, the Hannibal Doctrine and others. I'm sure you've talked about before where there are times when Israel prefers to actually kill its own people before they can be taken hostage. There are other uh, Dahia Doctrine and others that say that it's it's acceptable to kill your own civilians if you need it to shut down a terrorist operation. So I'm not saying that I know all of the facts. What I'm saying is none of us do right now. And and there has been a lot of inflammatory, incendiary allegations made because if you say it was Hamas, you can accuse them of anything. You can say that they were literally eating people's body organs on that day. And there's a significant portion of the Israeli public and unfortunately the American public that will believe it without requesting a single shred of evidence. John Fetterman. Look at, yeah, well, hey, I'll, I'll do you one better. Joe Biden. Joe yeah. Biden is out there. He, you know, not once, not twice, but th at least three times, Joe Biden has said that he saw pictures of babies that were beheaded by Hamas. Not even the Israeli government has, it continues to make that assertion. I went through, I read the names of every single Israeli civilian that has been identified as being killed. There was a little girl who was 10 months old that was shot while she was in her mother's arm. Uh, arms. She is the only child under one that was documented to have been killed that day. There were a number of other children. The Israelis initially said 40 babies were beheaded. They told stories about living children being placed in ovens. There yeah. is no evidence, that, but the most powerful person in the world, Joe Biden, uh, or at least Joe Biden, the body of Joe Biden is filling the position of the most powerful person in the world. He keeps repeating this propaganda. They laid siege to Al-Shifa hospital, telling us there was the Hamas Pentagon underneath it. And then when the Israelis actually went in there, the Baghdad Bob of the IDF takes cameras down there. And what do they find? They find something that looks kind of like an old underground operating room with an air conditioner that wasn't even attached. And it looked like no one had been in there for a very long time. I wouldn't be shocked if Hamas guys hung out in hospitals. I know from reporters that that often people would like meet people to do interviews there. There's a difference between that and firing RPGs from the roof of Al Shifa. There's a difference between that and actually having a Hamas Pentagon under Al Shifa. So the United States said we have our own intelligence that indicates that that's true. The entire thing was a fraud. It was it was a fraud intended to to give cover to Israel to lay siege to civilian targets. So. To bring it back to what we're talking about today with this hearing, I didn't learn a single thing that I didn't already know from what the lawyers for South Africa said today, because everything they were saying is in the public domain. Yeah. But what was chilling about it was to hear it in a court that under the law has the authority to say to Israel, this must stop immediately. And, and, and that actually is worth something because it's going to call the question to nations around the world on whether they believe in international law or they think that the United States should continue to be the emperor over international jurisprudence where it dictates who the law applies to and who it doesn't apply to. One final thing, it was really chilling when they started reciting. And, and if you read their 84 page filing, the South Africans, over the course of nine full pages, they are citing quotes from Israeli officials that are clearly genocidal in nature. Um, you know, not just Benjamin Netanyahu invoking the biblical tale of Amalek and you know, kill all their children, their women, the, the 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 babies, the livestock, but others talking about genocidal intent. And what they did is they they played some of those by video, they read others, and then they connected it to soldiers on the ground clearly understanding those as official orders. That is genocidal intent. And you know, I was struck by the the thought, because I've followed all these statements that these guys have made, these criminal genocidal statements, but hearing it in that court today, I realized the reason that Netanyahu and Yoav Gallant and all these other people feel so comfortable making such shocking genocidal statements publicly is that they have the confidence that nothing will ever happen to them as a result of making those statements. It doesn't even register to them that anyone would be able to hold them accountable because the bully of the world is their backer, the United States. And already these toadies, you know, John Kirby at the White House, National Security Council, 
you know, Matt Miller, a guy who has no soul and no conscience out there every day shilling for the genocidal operations. Who's done such a poor, piss poor job that even the IDF had to, at a certain point, be like, all right, right. You're, get, you're getting ahead of this and you're causing political pressure for us internally inside of Israel by by yeah. speculating on, like, potentially the, the reasons as to why Hamas is not releasing some of the female IDF soldiers, which at the time was, once again like you've mentioned, presented as though these were also female civilians and not like active enemy combatants that they'd uh, held captive as prisoners of war, uh, as, as hostages, and that uh, they were refusing to release them. And, and, and Miller famously speculated that it's because uh, Hamas wants to, or either has harmed them or wants to harm them further, and that's why they refused, and that's why the negotiations fell apart. This was so yeah. out there and caused uh, so much political turmoil in Israel that the IDF had to correct the American State Department. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 totally true. I mean, when 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 you have people like Benjamin Netanyahu saying, "Hey, tone it down a little bit," you know, like that 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 says something. You know, it reminds me though, Hassan, of 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 this story about Biden from uh, which I think is one of the most revealing stories. I mean, first, first of all, people should understand Joe Biden's been in office longer than almost any American politician. You know, fifty years, senator, uh, vice president, president, and you know, since nineteen seventy three, he's been a totally committed uh, Zionist. He calls himself, oh, yeah. you know, Israel. Israel's best Catholic friend. But in 1982, when the Israelis invaded Lebanon, a guy named Menachem Begin was the prime minister of Israel. And he comes to Washington because the Reagan administration actually, even though they were, you know, Reagan was an incredibly pro-Israel president, but they were concerned about the mounting civilian death toll. And if you go back, at one point, Reagan even, even told the Israelis that it's starting to look like a Holocaust. He used the term Holocaust. So con contrast that with, you know, Biden today. But Biden at the time was a senator. So Menachem Begin comes to Washington and he gets grilled by all these American senators over the rising civilian death toll. And Begin then goes back to Israel. He talks to reporters and he tells reporters, but there was one senator who stood up. This is 1982. One senator who stood up and gave an impassioned defense of our invasion of Lebanon and said that if he was in the same position in the United States and he was dealing with an, you know, a, a threat like that, he also would support the killing of women and children. And Begin says, you know, that senator was a guy named Joe Biden. And I told, and Begin himself was a war criminal from 1948 in the Ergun militias, you know, as part yeah. of the original Nakba. So this guy is saying, I had to tell that senator, no, 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 those aren't our values. So Biden, even back back then in 1982, was going further than the Israelis in, you know, at, at, at least in this meeting with Begin, in defending the killing of women and children. You know, no one should pretend that Biden doesn't enthusiastically support what's happening right now. His entire career indicates that that's exactly what, what he believes. And also Antony Blinken has never met a war in the Middle East that he just wasn't, you know, in love with. Yeah, he has been a, a very enthusiastic supporter. And I think he's ideologically stuck at a different time. Like, I think maybe because of his brain capacity diminishing or whatever. But, like, I do think that there is a diminish. Like, there, our soft power and our influence around the world as the United States of America is, like, waning a little bit right now. And and yet I feel as though there... Th this is the reason why there's so much a division even in the State Department as far as what we see in the media with people coming out and saying, like, we got to dial this back. Even Anthony Blinken, who, like you correctly pointed out, uh, has never met a war he doesn't like in the Middle East, was on uh, after meeting with Hakan Fidan in Turkey on October 8th, had actually tweeted, knowing full well what was about to happen, the scale of the atrocities that Israel was about to commit, had tweeted out a cessation of the hostilities and then quickly deleted it. And I feel like there's a reason for that. And the, I, I think that they're internally, they recognize that letting Israel operate in the way that it has with impunity has made America look weaker uh, in the eyes of the rest of the world, in my opinion. I feel as though this also is a grave threat to those who want to maintain the American empire to a certain well, degree. Well, look at, I mean, yeah, I mean, a bunch of things there I, I, I think are really smart points. I mean, also with the you know with the war in ukraine and the fact that the united states and it's nato um you know and particularly germany now has totally transformed itself into into a, a war machine where it is exporting uh, military hardware it's um it's starting to flirt now with troop deployments it's becoming a very aggressive it's 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 sort of like a mini it's it wants to become apparently like a mini america in europe right now what what though is what's lingering on on the sides of this look at china 
China has has for many decades operated in a much smarter way uh, than the United States on the continent of Africa in its approach to international conflict. Um, you know, China is now under Xi Jinping making a run at sort of being a, a, a global diplomatic force to try to uh, make peace between different countries. So, I mean, I, I, I think that the United States is flailing in its imperial project in, in many ways. But what you're also seeing, like in the case of the, the Gaza war right now, you know, there's this axis of resistance that's been formed, as 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 it's called in Iran, where you have the Iranians, you have Hezbollah in Lebanon, you have Hamas in uh, in Gaza, um, you have the Ansar al Islam uh, uh, Ansar Allah in uh, in Yemen, the Houthis. Um, who, who that, that's a whole other story unto oh, itself. Yeah. I've spent a lot. I've spent a lot of time in Yemen. You know, the the. Yemen declares, you know, war against Israel and is has implemented a, a very successful blockade to the to the point where the United, that they have the most powerful, you know, western military forces in the world now deploying to go after the, you know, the poorest country in the Arab world, uh, you know, and and they are defiant, utterly defiant. By the um, way, this is uh, yeah. di this just yep. broke, actually, uh, according to the political editor of the Times, Stephen Swinford. Britain is now expected to join the U.S. in carrying airstrikes on Houthi military positions in Yemen tonight. Rishi Sunak briefed cabinet on imminent military intervention this evening. Sir Keir Starmer, labor, le uh, labor leader, and Sir Lindsey Hoyle, the common speaker, have also been briefed. So they are finally, uh, I guess, uh, even the British are finally... Uh, getting involved in in trying to combat this blockade, which I think is moral I mean, and just, by the way. That's my personal perspective on it. You don't have to agree with, like, Ansar Allah's uh, uh, political positions or whatever, but uh, ultimately I do think no, that, and I, that yeah. they're doing well, uh, the right thing. I mean, look at... I, I, I mean, I asked really early on in this slaughter in Gaza that the Israelis are conducting. I talked to uh, Rashid Khalidi, you know, the 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 one of the most important uh, Palestinian intellectuals in the world, a professor at Columbia University, and I was asking him, you know, about Arab nations and 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 their position, just sort of watching this happen. And he, you know, he said it's been many decades before any of them, ha since any of them have been willing to do anything. So for Yemen to do this um, is is quite extraordinary. And, um, you know, in the eyes of many in the Arab street, they're, they're uh, utter heroes for what they're doing. Set aside, you know, who the Houthis are or what's happened in Yemen. Just the fact that everyone is watching this mass slaughter and saying, you know, where are the Arab nation states? Why is no one confronting um, Israel? It, it it actually matters. And look, uh, what's what's happening in Lebanon is is really concerning. You know, the Israelis are um, intensifying their attacks. Hezbollah is uh, also carried out a strike against a fairly significant um, Israeli military base. The Israelis have had to evacuate tens of thousands of their own citizens from the border with Lebanon. And uh, let me tell you something: Hezbollah ain't Hamas. You know, Hezbollah is a v much more serious. Uh, um, fighting force with much yeah. more sophisticated weaponry. I mean, Hamas largely is manufacturing its own weapons. I mean, obviously it gets weapons smuggled in. I, you know, there's no question about that. But Hamas is, is you know, is at a stage where Hezbollah was, you know, 10 plus years ago. And, you know, so Hezbollah is also the only force in, in recent years to defeat Israel. And if the Israelis think that they're going to be able to fight a multi-front war without uh, constant U.S. rearmament, um, they're sadly mistaken. Because you know the reason that Anthony Blinken keeps having to circumvent congressional review to push through emergency shipments of tank shells is that the Israelis can't sustain this without the United States. So when people say, oh, what do you want Biden to do? He's not the president of Israel. Uh, no, he's the arms dealer of Israel. Um, he's the political yeah. defender of Israel. If Biden yeah. wanted this thing shut down, it would be shut down. That's what happened in 2021. Biden said, basically said to Netanyahu, One okay, phone call. you've let, you've let yeah. it burn enough. Um, and, you know, within 48 hours, there, were, there was a, a peace deal being brokered between, you know, with the Egyptians and, and Israel. Even this time around, when Yoav Gallant, who famously, the defense minister, said uh, the, we're fighting human animals and that's why we have to shut off their food, electricity, and everything, like all aid going into Gaza, had to back away from that position at least marginally early, uh, like a month into the, to the ethnic cleansing campaign. And when uh, Israeli media asked him why uh, he is allowing aid to go into Gaza, albeit limited aid, but still any aid to go into Gaza, he very famously said... And this was like often not really reported in uh, in American media, but he very famously said, 
Well, what am I supposed to do? They America asked us to do that. What am I going to do? Say no to America? And that is the reality. And that's precisely the reason why Israel, in my opinion, does probably more media, more Western facing media in English than it does in Hebrew for its own domestic audience. And there's proof for this as well. Benjamin Netanyahu has actually appeared on Western television more times since October 7th than he has on Israeli television. So uh, there's a reason for that. It's because he already has a, a, a tremendous amount of support for the actions in Gaza. He doesn't have a lot of support overall. Obviously, the overwhelming majority of the Israeli population want him to resign immediately. Um, but yeah, I mean, his constituency as... is along the Potomac, you know, it's, yeah. uh, it's you know, and, and I mean, one other interesting, uh, you know, thing about that, and and it, it doesn't really get talked a lot uh, about a lot, um, but Israel I, I think Israel is actually militarily losing the war against Hamas. And, you know, people might say, oh, what are you talking about? Israel's waged a very effective campaign against the civilians of Gaza. They, they've done it. They've, they, they really have perfected the art of mass murder of women oh, yeah. and children and the elderly and killing, you know, 200 plus, uh, you know, medical workers, uh, destroying all of the hospitals, causing starvation, uh, causing uh, endemic diarrhea among children. They're really successful at the war they're waging against the civilians. But if you actually are monitoring both the Israeli propaganda and Hamas's media channels, Hamas is constantly posting videos of them blowing up. Um, of their operatives blowing up Israeli tanks, uh, killing Israeli soldiers. There's there's one video where the, the, a Hamas operative pops up from a tunnel hatch in the middle of a camp where um, Israeli soldiers are just sitting around, hanging out, and they film them around, just showing we can access you anywhere, anytime. Yeah. The, these, these tunnels that they have under Gaza, hundreds of kilometers of them, the Israelis captured a video from an engineering corps of Hamas building some of these tunnels. And, you know, they're use, they have to use equipment that um, doesn't register seismically to dig out some of these tunnels because the Israelis have such extensive surveillance around it. Um, but there's a video of Yahya Sinwar, the head of Hamas, his brother Mohammed, driving a car through the tunnels. And he's sort of like, you know, take a right here, then a left there. Um, you know, the Israelis have not penetrated even a fraction of these tunnels. And so the point I'm getting at here is that this is going to hit a point where Hamas is not going to be defeated. Um, you know, Israel desperately needs to, to kill Mohammed Daif or, you know, the, the military commander of Qasem Brigades or Abu Obeda, the, the spokesperson, or yeah. Yahya Sinwar. They have to kill somebody so they can say, ah, we did it. Here's our victory. But the reality is that they're not even militarily defeating Hamas right now. They yeah. are militarily exterminating and expelling uh, the Palestinian population, forcing them into a smaller and smaller killing cage. That's what they're doing. But top Israeli defense reporters are starting to hint at this, that this isn't going well for Israel uh, on a tactical military level. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, it's the classic... It's the classic uh, struggle against an occupying power as well, uh, just like Ho Chi Minh has said before. And I think, like, even I, either it was the PFLP or the DFLP leader at the time who said, like, you kill 10 of us, we kill one of yours, we're not going anywhere. You, It's going to end when you get tired, right? And, right, and, and remember, that is the dynamic. And remember that, that, you know, people say, oh, yeah, well, look what happened to ISIS, you know, in Iraq. Hamas is not ISIS, you yeah. know, and and Hamas, you, you, no one wants to really talk about this, but why why does Hamas exist? I mean, part of the story has to do with, you know, Netanyahu um, and, and other, you know, extremists in Israel wanting Hamas to exist because they viewed it as the best way to prevent a Palestinian state. If you had people that were perceived as extremists or violent jihadists or, you know, what have you. But the reason, the act, the political reason why Hamas or Hezbollah or any of these groups exist is because of the occupation, is because yeah. of settler colonialism, um, is because of imperial agendas, is because of exterminating people from their lands. And the people of Gaza in particular, and I'm sure you remember this, Hassan, in 2018 and 2019, the Palestinians organized a massive nonviolent series of marches that, that spanned yeah. months. The Every Great Friday, return, it was yeah. called the Great March of Return. And Israel... Uh, responded with utter force to those nonviolent demonstrations. In fact, Israeli snipers, some of them who gave their actual name, have openly admitted in the Israeli media that they were keeping account of who could kill, who could shoot the most kneecaps 
of Palestinian 42 protesters. 42 in one day, one, uh, one right. IDF sniper uh, openly yes. uh, stated. So, the IDF and, and, itself and took ownership over it. The IDF oh. itself took ownership over it yes. when they tweeted out and then quickly deleted, even though Betselem captured it for uh, posterity, uh, yes. that they had accounted for every single bullet and where it had yeah. landed. Tens of yeah. thousands of people were intentionally maimed, wounded by Israeli sniper rifles. I mean, uh, pregnant women so when were you, killed. So, yeah. so when, when, when that is the response to a nonviolent demonstration, which presumably is what the world uh, is telling the Palestinians, that that's the proper way to resist Israel is nonviolently. You don't do things like raid a military base or kidnap a soldier or any, or, you know, take a soldier prisoner. Those things are unacceptable, but nonviolent protest, that's acceptable. Well, actually it's not acceptable because then you get shot in the kneecap or you have pregnant women getting shot. So when, when that is the message, what means do the Palestinians have of resistance? Why is it that Hamas now, the armed resistance in, in Gaza right now, is incredibly popular among Palestinians? Why yeah. is that? Is it because people, everyone loves Hamas? No, it's because a child is Hamas. A journalist is Hamas. The hospital is Hamas. Everyone in, in Gaza is Hamas. There are no children. The UN. There, there are no civilians. The UN is Hamas. Um, the UN Secretary General is Hamas. Um, Ireland South is Africa. Hamas, Spain South is Africa Hamas. Hamas, South Africa is Hamas, Belgium is Hamas. When everyone becomes Hamas, when 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 you shoot and murder nonviolent protesters, when you intentionally kneecap them with sniper bullets, of course the only means available to the people is armed resistance. Yeah. It's 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 also what happened with the Irish. It's what happened in South Africa. It's what happened in revolutionary struggles all over the world, and. I'll, I'll say one last thing on this. No one should believe a single word that ever comes out of the mouth of Israeli government spokespeople unless there's like three or four independent sources showing that it's true because yeah. they have lied about everything. And, you know, it's not that I say, oh, give Hamas the benefit of any doubt. It's that you don't give Israel the benefit of any doubt. Like Israel lies repeatedly and it's documentable through this entire... We can yeah. talk about the last three months, but you can also talk about decades. They're lying about everything constantly. So no, their word should not be worth a penny when it comes to a statement of the facts on the ground in Gaza. Nothing. Yeah. And Western media absolutely is complicit because they have basically a standing IDF spokesperson early on since October 8th to immediately contextualize the, the violence that uh, the, the Israeli forces are subjecting the Palestinian people to in their ethnic cleansing campaign. And, and beyond that, whenever Israel will come out as a state actor and openly lie and even deliver inconsistent, sometimes incoherent evidence, false evidence, as to, uh, you know, whether they were the ones who struck the, the, uh, the Al-Ahli hospital or the Al-Shifa hospital and how Israel never would strike a hospital, immediately the media jumps on that and actually changes, in my opinion, the way they're the the way they have covered the atrocities. Two yeah. things I wanted to point to here. Uh, one is uh, a, an analysis that I saw. Hold on, let me see if I can pull this up really quickly. Uh, one is an analysis that I saw about uh, the way that uh, the atrocities have been covered in Western media and how. Mark oh, you're talking. This was a piece that the Intercept did. That uh, it was uh, Adam Johnson. Um, uh, you're talking about the analysis of uh, American newspapers and how they uh, cover Palestinian deaths versus Israeli deaths. Yeah, yeah, exactly. The, the intercept coverage, yes. The disproportionate coverage mentions of Palestinian deaths declined. Uh, new study shows that the New York Times, Washington Post, and LA Times is systematic bias. For every two Palestinian deaths, Palestinians are mentioned once. For every Israeli death, Israelis are mentioned eight times or at a rate of 16 times more per death than of Palestinians. I mean, and, and uh, look, we also did a story recently, my colleague Dan Bogoslaw, showing that, you know, CNN, any report that is done by CNN, including reports that are done in the United States that deal in any way with Israel, have to be run through the Jerusalem Bureau of CNN, which is subject to the Israeli censors' uh, oversight. Um, yeah. you know, and, and I mean, th I, I remember a story that like the late Alex Coburn did you know, back in 1999 about CNN having interns uh, from the Pentagon in their newsroom uh, during the, the, the bombing of Serbia. Um, you know, th there's a long uh, tradition of news outlets um, subjecting themselves without full disclosure to censorship and monitoring by government entities. And there's a crossbreeding between, you know, a revolving door. It's not just lobbyists and politicians. Also in media, you have people hopping from government positions back to media and back and forth. 
And, you know, some some news outlets also are working with people who uh, are just fresh out of their jobs being propagandists for the Israeli government. So, you know, I mean, we're we're look, the Palestinians are, are being systematically killed off in Gaza right now. There's plans to try to force them into the Sinai Peninsula, a long kind of colonialist uh, uh, you know, dream. News organizations are doing what they always do, which is that they give um, every lie that Israel floats gets sort of a pass. And every single claim of a Palestinian death has to be like quadruple proven. Um, you know, look at the president yeah. of the United States says, oh, you know, uh, I, don't, I don't have any faith in those uh, in those death numbers. Actually, to, to be quite blunt here, the Hamas Ministry of Health death numbers are are almost certainly conservative because of the formula that they use, where it has to be someone that's come through the hospital system or the morgue system in some yeah. way. There are there are other estimates when you take into account missing people and under the rebels that are far higher. Uh, and, and I think they're reasonable numbers far higher than the Hamas run health ministry numbers. The, the whole thing, the world is upside down. The, 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 the victims have to like go out of their way to prove that their loved ones died. Look what they're doing to Wael Dadu, the, the, the bureau chief of Al Jazeera yeah. um, Arabic in Gaza. They murdered this man's family. His entire and, family. And yeah. They murdered his family. Then they murder his cameraman and leave him for five hours bleeding out. And then last week they then murder his his oldest son who was a reporter and then the israelis say after after anthony blinken made the big mistake of answering a question and expressing some uh sorrow for wael daudu's suffering that his entire family has been systematically murdered by you know uh blinken's friends in israel blinken makes this mistake and the israelis then magically pop up and they say here's a document we found proving that wael daudu's uh son who also was a journalist actually was a, a secret terrorist operative and on the payroll of the Islamic and, Jihad. Yeah. Yeah. Of, of the, of the Islamic Jihad. I don't believe for one second that, that uh, Israel deserves to be able to make such an allegation without actual proof. And, and like, we know from, you know, their Baghdad, Bob, his, his conduct in the hospital where he shows the scheduling sheet and says, aha, see, this is the, this is the sheet where all the Hamas terrorists were signing up for their guard shift duty to guard Israeli hostages. And it turns out it said nothing of the sort, you know, it just took one person speaking Arabic to look at it and say, it doesn't say what you're saying. It says, I think that when we look at a hundred, uh, I think we're on almost 110 journalists now that have been killed over the past three months um, by Israel. It's a, it's a mass murder campaign against journalists. And, you know, look, Evan Gershkovich, who's in prison in Russia, I think he should be freed. I, would, I, I think it was an atrocious war crime that, this, a crime that the Saudis committed by butchering Jamal Khashoggi. But where are all the big CNN stars of the world who every day tweet, this is how many days that Evan Gershkovich has been in prison. Where are they when 110 of your colleagues have been murdered, murdered with American bombs? murdered with american bombs yeah. clearly in an intentional campaign to wipe it out you know the washington post has the audacity to keep on the on on their you know thing that you know democracy dies in the darkness where where is the systematic outrage from american journalists over the murder of our palestinian colleagues they are the eyes and ears of the world to a genocide that is unfolding in real time and, yeah. and, and many of them, their families have been killed. Their houses have been destroyed. Their colleagues, their cameramen, their, their, their every, they're being systematically killed. And where is the solidarity? It's, it's devastatingly horrible. Uh, I'm, I'm ashamed to be an American journalist, actually, right now. I'm ashamed to be an American journalist because we have failed, utterly failed our colleagues in Palestine, utterly failed them. Absolutely. There's another thing I wanted to talk about, uh, about the International Court of Justice, because tomorrow, or at least I, I guess in a couple hours, uh, we were supposed to hear from the Israeli side on its defenses, right, against the gross accusations of genocide and ethnic cleansing, which has been clearly laid out uh, oftentimes with evidence that the Israeli soldiers and, like you said, the Israeli officials have voluntarily given themselves. And um, their reaction to that, I suspect, is going to be somewhere along the boundaries of how they've tried to contextualize this violence and why it's a necessity over and over again since October 7, a relitigation of October 7, uh, with, with some of the uh, most um, embellished aspects of it, in my opinion. And then uh, beyond that, talk about how this is actually a war against Hamas and not against the Palestinian population, and it's oopsie, uh, you know, it ends up killing uh, overwhelmingly, uh, I believe, 70% women, children, children, elderly, like outside of the, 
the male combatant uh, age group, which even then is not uh, 100% that is going to be a, a militant regardless. So one thing I wanted to ask about is uh, what do you suspect will happen when this court case goes through if the court itself finds uh, that Israel is not guilty, I guess, of the accusation of uh, conducting a genocide? And while yeah. you answer that question, I'm going to go pee really quickly. I'm going to be away for like one second, but chat will listen and I will hear you as well. Sorry. All right. Let's talk some shit about Hassan while he's gone. No, um, well, I mean, it's it's going to be interesting to see how how Israel actually presents its defense. Um, obviously, there there almost certainly is going to be, uh, you know, a sort of detailed retelling of the Israeli version of the events of October 7th. And, you know, I think they're, they're going to try to put the focus on the, you know, on the fact that they their their perspective is that they're fighting a war against terrorism and they're going to compare it to you know 9-11 and talk about principles of self-defense and they'll of, of course present a legal based argument um to, to argue that in fact they have the right to do this that's and, and it's you know probably gonna gonna be a well-presented legal argument because it, you know israel has very serious uh lawyers but what i think is a problem and and I think that that in the absence of this, I think it would be much easier to uh, see the court letting Israel off the hook, so to speak, is that Israel, uh, its own officials from Netanyahu to the defense minister Gallant to Herzog, the president, to multiple members of the cabinet, to uh, members of the Knesset, they're on record, on video, on audio, saying openly genocidal things. And, and so... You know, all of the facts that were presented today um, in the court by South Africa's lawyers about the nature of the crimes and the argument that these crimes constitute genocide, Israel is going to have legal response to all of those things. There is no question. And, you know, if you were just a kind of completely neutral person who was just walking in out of nowhere with no context and your only job is to listen to legal arguments, I'm sure Israel's going to going to do some of their lawyers are going to do an effective job at um at arguing their case. The problem that they're going to run into though at the end of the day is that the public is deeply aware of the fact that Netanyahu made these statements, that Herzog made these statements, that Gallant made these statements. I think that actually is the strongest evidence. It's stronger evidence than the, the and it's sad that this is true, than the sheer destruction of civilian life and infrastructure and culture in Gaza. The, the most damning thing, I think, for the Israelis, the riskiest part of the case for them is that they've all been caught on tape openly saying these things. You know, one of the lawyers for South Africa said today, usually you have to dig up these kinds of statements to prove genocidal intent. And he said, yeah. what's extraordinary about this is that they said all of these things and they're continuing to say these things. So, and even if you, if you read the Israeli press, there have been several columns in the Israeli press saying that this is the thing Israel is concerned about with this case is, is that, you know, it's, it, you don't need Chris Hansen to come into the, you know, into the room and be like, here, let's play the tape. I mean, it's like, they're saying it on an ongoing basis. You know, they, they, there was no need to secretly record anybody saying anything. They were giving speeches, laying out everything they were going to do. So not that I, I, I can imagine being sympathetic to Israel's legal arguments, but I would predict that they're going to do an effective job at arguing in a kind of meticulous way that, you know, this statute and that statute apply here and that we had a right to do this and that, you know, this is not true. You know, even though the, the UN said this, let's look at who the UN personnel are. They'll probably try to put some of the UN people on, you know, trial by default or whatever. But, but setting that aside, it's, it, it's all caught on tape. It's all caught on tape. And that, I think, is what makes this an extraordinary situation. Because can you imagine, you know, those judges listening to that stuff today and then later being like, yeah, we rule that 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 didn't indicate any genocidal intent. I mean, it just when you take that combined with even if half of what South Africa said today was true and you combine it with Netanyahu and Herzog and Gallant and all these statements that that's a slam dunk case, you know, showing genocidal intent. And and that's the standard here. They don't need to prove that they did that that they committed genocide. South Africa just needs to convince the court that that there's jurisdiction and a reasonable basis to have a a, a, a trial on this. And then the judges have to stop it. So I, I don't I, I think there's a solid chance the judges rule in South Africa's favor. Um, but nothing is ever certain in in these matters. And you know I bet the U.S., Israel, and others are are have everybody wiretapped. 
and are listening to everything that everyone is saying. They probably have all of the South African lawyers bugged. They probably have the court chambers bugged. I mean, you know, the NSA is probably listening to everything, but whether or not the U.S. is going to be able to actually do anything uh, to stop it, I don't know. I mean, it's... Well, uh, but even it's if they one. do, even if they rule in favor of South Africa, like what mechanisms uh, does the United Nations have in this circumstance? Yeah, they ruled beyond... against Russia. I mean, yeah. they ruled against Russia and Putin was basically like, you know, I'll, I'll use that that order as a piece of toilet paper. I mean, it's, you know, it, there is no actual enforcement mechanism. And you know why there's no inf enforcement mechanism? Because of the United States. Yeah, because exactly. Because if, if the... If the United States agreed to play by the rules that they want the Rwandas of the world to be subjected to or the Putins of the world uh, subjected to, then you have a real serious case to be made to Vladimir Putin and say, oh, hold on a second. If the United States is doing this and you're not, no, you're the rogue of the world. The problem is that the U.S. is just a more sophisticated kind of rogue and, uh, and pays a lot of lip service to the rule of law. Putin's very happy to be perceived as a gangster. You know, but the, the U.S. wants to be perceived in a different manner. So you but you're asking a real question, which is there is no enforcement mechanism and there's no enforcement mechanism by design because the United States won't allow it. But what is significant and what I think is real is that if the court does rule that that Israel needs to stop this, huge pressure is going to be then put yes. on America's European allies, because how is it that the European Union is is going to then stand up and say, Oh no, we support the flagrant uh, violation of an order from the world court that we all have accepted the jurisdiction of. That's the problem here. And 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 so I don't have any illusion that like, you know, the United Nations is going to, you know, deploy blue helmets to go and stop Netanyahu's bloody rampage. But this is going to be an interesting development in Europe because a lot of American allies are, are going to be in a bad situation because they don't go as far as the United States on, on these issues. You know, the, the U.S. is, you know, definitely they want the U.S. to do what it's doing. They like that the U.S. is taking the hit for vetoing every, you know, all this. But at the end of the day, they have to deal with their own public. And, you know, the general public in many European countries they're, they're getting increasingly fed up with this stuff. They're also sick of the war in Ukraine. They're sick of their energy prices rise. I mean, there's lots of factors. Yeah. You have fascist parties increasing in popularity in Germany and elsewhere. I mean, there's there's a powder keg that, that exists right now in Europe. And so the timing of this is, is quite interesting. So bottom line is no chance it would be enforced. Almost certainly Israel will, will ignore it and continue on with U.S. Uh, backing to some degree. I don't know how the U.S. publicly would state that, but it's going to be a problem in Europe. Yeah. Then there is the other side, but you're, you're absolutely correct. I think also that uh, the the worst aspect of this for, uh, I guess, uh, instruments of power in the Western world will be the civilian pressure, like their civil society uh, getting more of a go-ahead to like openly state, no, this is like an international court of justice ruling. This is genocidal unconditionally. It's not dissimilar to what happened after Amnesty International. Doing more Nicorette here. Oh, same. I'm a, I'm a yeah. big Nicorette guy myself. I alternate um, between, I don't like any of the flavors. You know, I yeah. alternate between like the mint and then the, the non-flavor one. Oh my God, I that's what take. I do as well. I have the regular bubble gum here and then the mint one here. Yeah. The coated one. I got, yeah. I got these ones. I, I have the European kind though. It's not as good as the American stuff. I need oh, to. Probably. This is the good stuff. This is Nicorette. It's like four milligram and two milligram. I, I, I just dropped down those. to two milligram. Oh, nice. I mean, it's very effective if you're looking to stop smoking. I've been chewing it for years, but I stopped smoking years ago, but I still chew. I know. I've, I've, I've narrowed my vice down. I'm on no pharmaceuticals except an allergy medication, and I just am on the, the nicotine. I don't drink alcohol anymore. Same. I can't live without my nicotine. Same. Um, All right. Anyway, so, we were talking about something serious. I didn't mean to do a commercial. No, no, it's fine. I, it's, I'm, a, I'm in the same boat. But... Um, the thing I was going to say is beyond the pressure. We're talking about civil, about civil society and. Yeah, civil you know. society and the, the pressure that will mount towards uh, uh, like the unconditional support afforded to uh, to Israel making like a less popular position. It kind of cuts through that. And we saw a version of this in Amnesty International and other NGOs like human rights groups that normally do, in my opinion, oftentimes operate alongside the American State Department's interests, usually against America's foreign adversaries more often than not uh this was one of those instances when in 2000 uh in 21 
when they all collectively openly admitted something that many people have known for quite a long time, that Israel was an apartheid state that often, in my opinion, that was a, a part of the sea change, a part of the attitude mm. shift, because it gave the permission to many, I guess, like squishy liberals even to openly state things as they are, that Israel is undeniably an apartheid state. And I think that the ICJ decision, if it favors the South African position, will play a similar role. And, and oh, uh, you know, yeah. slowly but surely it will chip away at the uh, marginally chip away at the at the dominance that uh, Israel has on Western media and, and uh, you know, our, our interests. But, you know, earlier in your show, before I came on, I was watching and, you know, you 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 made reference to sort of people that are on your feed sort of being more tapped in um, to things. And I'm sure that that's totally true. And and this is true in general of a lot of, uh, you know, the, 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 the generation of people that are coming into adulthood right now. It, it's really interesting to look at how people get their information and they're not held captive to you know, just corporate media or, you know, major media or media that, you know, most quote unquote grownups have even heard of. And on this issue, you know, you, you can talk to, you can stop a random young person, you know, in, in the cities of many countries around the world and, and start talking to them about Palestine or Israel, and they're going to know a bunch about it. Um, and what I think is really interesting is that this trick of the Israeli government of trying to force the world to believe that criticism of the Israeli government is criticism of Judaism or criticism of Jews or is anti-Semitism, that's done. That era's finished. That doesn't work anymore. Yeah. Um, and that's this is a recent thing. It, oh, it yeah. does not work anymore. And I mean, I'm, I'm getting called an anti-Semite uh, every day by these people. You know, by 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 these wackadoodles who who are trying to convince the world that um, Israel somehow means Judaism. I, th I talk to my 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 friends who are Jewish all the time, and everybody is uh, like saying that like th these people do not represent us. And yeah. but this is new. This is new that that is piercing into the mainstream. This is the point I'm getting at. I think there's been a a, a paradigm shattered here, um, and I and I think that you know people whose brains have not been poisoned by Hasbara and the sort of propaganda industry from Israel and in the United States, where it's drilled into your head too in American politics that you must support um, Israel, it's shifting, you know? And you know, in Germany, I'm in Germany right now, in Germany, they have these speech laws on anti-Semitism oh, and yeah. they're, uh, they're arresting people. Hundreds upon hundreds of people have been arrested uh, on anti-Semitic speech laws for simply protesting against uh, Israel's genocidal campaign in Gaza, including an elderly Jewish Israeli uh, woman arrested twice in a five day period in Berlin. They're talking about trying to make a law that says, if you want to become a naturalized citizen, you know, Germany has a huge Turkish population an increasingly large Arab population. They're trying to make a law that says as a condition for naturalization, that you have to sign a form recognizing the right of the state of Israel to exist. <laughs> it's like a, it's and, like a BDS law that you have in like Texas. If you want to get like contracts right. with the government, or if you want to be a right. public school teacher, you have to be like, I will never criticize Israel. <laughs> I promise never to be the Sharia law, but, um, yeah. but, but the point I'm getting at, though, is that so much of that propaganda that's been so effective at policing the American public um, on these issues, it's it's blowing up. And I also think that the world is actually quite horrified that Joe Biden, uh, the, the the man who uh, saved the world from Donald Trump and could have had a nice four years of Grandpa Joe in power, has revealed himself, like those of us that followed his career knew this, but has revealed himself now to the world to be an enthusiastic supporter of the annihilation of one of the most victimized groups of people on the planet whose concentration camp has now been transformed into a killing cage subjected to regular bombardment by American bombs. I think we're, we're entering a different world right now, and it is going to be a shit show in the American yeah. election in 24, oh. because you know, I think there is a difference between Biden and Trump. I think it's possible that Trump would have actually been doing U.S. drone strikes in Gaza. Um, oh, yeah. I, 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 you know, yeah, I, I, I've never bought the notion that Trump is some kind of dove or something like that. Um, you know, no, no, no. But of I, course I, not. I mean, this is a continuation of Trump's policies. This is the Abraham that's Accords. That's not an play. argument. Yeah, yeah. But this is, I'm not yeah. making an argument. The ergo, therefore, we should vote for, you know, Grandpa Joe. Um, what I'm saying is when they start shaming everybody, the Democrats, and they start saying, oh, you're going to give us Trump, you know, the answer to them is you did this. You did this. You yeah. did it by by uh, having Biden run again when he is a half brain dead potato 
You did it by uh, by uh, supporting uh, enthusiastically the extermination of the the people of Gaza yeah. by un by by saying there's no red line to what Netanyahu can do. They did this to themselves, and so. I don't know what the answer is on 2024, but I know this. If Donald Trump becomes president, it's Joe Biden's fault. Oh, it's absolutely. the Democratic Party's fault. Absolutely. Like you, there's none of this shaming people because they vote for Cornell West or Jill Stein. You gave them nothing to vote for when you conducted yourself in this manner and you ran this guy again and you did the things you did in office. Yeah. See, I mean, look, there's already people in the chat doing it right now. There's this idea within the liberal population, especially those who are like very tuned into the politics who like consume it all the time that like they love fighting the, the battle as though as though the Bernie bros are still alive. Right. They want to go back to the 2016 era of like you're going up against Hillary Clinton. How dare you? And, and try to relitigate those uh, struggles like as though there is like a unique leftist momentum within the democratic party and a and a representative that they can like a uh, champion that is somehow a threat to biden biden is alone and yet he is a threat to himself and he's a threat to american democracy he's a threat to the democratic party's power in this country and yet these guys are so primed so conditioned to constantly yell at voters and constantly yell at anyone but the democratic party as team players that they're like looking to relitigate those uh, Bernie bro yeah, but, arguments when there's no but, Bernie but to bro. Yeah, and Bernie actually has been a mixed bag on this. Yeah. Uh, on this Gaza war, exactly. he's doing some really he's doing some really smart things right now on a legislative level. So I give him credit for that. But my God, he was so bad for the first several months of this. But um, that that's a whole other show. But the the thing is, I, my question for anybody who is going to start vote shaming people, I want to see the receipts. I want to see how every single day you were calling the White House, telling Biden to stop supporting this genocidal slaughter in Gaza. I want to see your receipts. I want to see that you just spent endless hours working those phones, knocking on those doors, calling your precinct captains, doing everything you could to stop this stuff. I want to see the receipts that showed that you said Biden shouldn't run again because nobody actually wants him to run again. If you can't produce those receipts, I don't want to even talk to you about the 2024 election. I will talk to someone. If someone is saying, oh no, I passionately did it. I did all this stuff, but I'm scared of Trump for X, Y, and Z reason. And I'm totally with you. I agree. With okay, I'll talk to you about that because you sound like a really fundamentally good person. But if you're just some nitwit who every four years wants to vote shame people because they have an actual conscience, Get out of here. I mean, you're yeah. not a serious person. You're a cog in a machine. It's, it's a funny because that's a very common joke I also make. I ask people to show receipts or pay stubs from the DNC because it's like you shouldn't be doing this for free. You shouldn't be coming in here and, and defending the Democratic Party's like malpractice, Democratic Party's negligence uh, for free. At least some people get paid to do it. You know what I mean? Like, why are you operating? Why are you LARPing as a DC consultant and you don't even have a badge? You don't even have a shiny lanyard to, to show for it. <laughs> Yeah, go. I mean, go, go, go. Find one of the many Palestinians that live in the United States whose family members have been collectively murdered with American bombs, and sit down with them, and you tell them why they should be voting for Joe Biden. That that's what that that's what I want. I want to hear. I don't make the case to me or Hassan. Make make the case to a Palestinian whose entire family in Gaza has been killed on why they should be voting for Joe Biden. Like that. That really is the gold standard here. And if you're and if your case is. Oh my God! I I spent every waking minute trying to stop the war in Gaza. Okay, you're a person that I actually think should be listened to and taken seriously. Short of that, go away. You yeah. go make your vote and let everyone else vote their conscience. Um, uh, going back to the conflation, by the way, between anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism, uh, two things I wanted to talk about really briefly is that uh, the ADL already has been like a, a questionable organization from its inception, although obviously it's like foundational principle is supposed to be something that we all agree on, combating anti-Semitism in the United States of America, which is like a you know very harmful bigotry, and yet... Uh, through their, uh, I guess, historical collaboration with the apartheid South African government, spying on, you know, labor uh, leaders and Jewish Americans who are anti-apartheid at the time in the 80s, like anti-apartheid activists who are Jewish themselves. And now the continuation under Jonah Greenblatt's, uh, uh, his leadership, the ADL has openly for the first time ever revealed that um, it's anti-Semitism trackers, those numbers actually factor in pro-Palestinian protests. A a approximately yeah. a third of all of the anti-Semitic incidents logged since October 7th by the ADL are directly just simply pro 
Palestinian protests, oftentimes led by Jewish groups. The organization that is incredibly important as far as like what it's supposed to do, which is combat anti-Semitism, track anti-Semitism, has completely uh, faltered from the origination or from the original message. And there, like I said, it's been marred already. It's, its reputation has been tarnished in the past as well. However, now it's like at a time when anti-Semitism is rising, because it's oftentimes, as it oftentimes does, when Israel does conduct these acts of genocide and then people do look at that and go, okay, well, this is, you know, the responsibility of all Jews, which is inherently anti-Semitic to think. You see well, that. You have like Alan, that, you know, Alan Dershowitz, uh, you know, he's he's been running around and he's saying, oh, Jewish voices for peace um, doesn't actually have any real Jews in it. And they're just using them as props. And it's basically a, a front for a terror support group. Um, yeah, I don't mean to open the Dershowitz can of worms. I was just, just uh, popped into my ex. I, I saw Dersh. a clip of him the other day. Yeah, the, the I think he was supposed to be one of the lawyers representing Israel. Yeah, I'm um, so sad that the ICJ, and then I'm the so Epstein sad that the Jeffrey Epstein stuff took away from that well and i mean the questions about epstein's connections to mossad and you know and and, and other intelligence agencies i think is actually a very legitimate course of inquiry oh, yeah uh, you know it's it's i mean it's really it's really interesting the the way that the, the the shattering of the kind of media monopolies has 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 opened the gates and and um, it's an interesting media landscape right now. Very depressing in many ways, but also quite interesting. On the ADL issue, though, I mean, I think that what Netanyahu is doing and what the radical sort of uh, extremists that are defending Israel are doing by for trying to force a conflation of Judaism with the state of Israel is ultimately making uh, Jews less safe. And it 100%. is it's it's creating um, dangerous conditions because their messaging on it is that the Jewish state has a right to do this to Palestinian Muslims, um, and not to mention that they're also doing it to Palestinian Christians, etc. Yeah. But but that is that is sort of the message that they're sending. And it's really dangerous and um, and reckless. I, I used to, throughout the whole so-called war on terror, and especially during Obama, when I was traveling to Somalia and Yemen and Afghanistan, all these places, and in place after place after place, what I saw on the ground was that our actions, the U.S.'s own actions, the drone strikes, the killing of families, the sort of perception that we were a gratuitous enemy, uh, doing the night raids, killing pregnant women, you know, all these stories that I did. Everywhere I was realizing we are giving people a legitimate reason to actually want to attack Americans. And, and, and we shouldn't be doing that. This is not, you know, I'm not in the business of giving advice to the United States government, but we, we should be looking at, do our actions make us more safe or less safe? And the same is true, you know, for the Israeli government. I, I, I don't see how you can conclude anything other than Netanyahu has looked at this and said, I'm okay with making Jews across the world less safe because this is my agenda and my agenda matters more than anything else. I mean, this, this is yeah. madness. It's utter madness. Of course, there's, there's you know, anti-Semitism is v utterly vile. And, and certainly we see it flaring in so many places around the world. Um, Especially on then, Twitter uh, with, the, with the likes of Elon Musk, like uh, openly oh, unbanning oh. anti-Semites. Yeah. No, absolutely. And, you know, so, but, but at the end of the day, we need to have a discussion of, of how we actually confront real anti-Semitism. And when the ADL is categorizing people using their powers in a democratic society to nonviolently protest about the actions of another nation that is engaged in a genocidal yeah. war, and you say that simply doing that is anti-Semitic or using the term from the river to the sea, that it's anti-Semitic, this is very dangerous because it cheapens the experience of those who actually are suffering from anti-Semitism. Yeah. This is this is also true by the way for the events of October 7th when you promote things that are false when you make up incendiary stories to try to make your uh the, your enemies look like vicious animals and you want to strip them of any humanity whatsoever you're also doing a grave disservice to the dead and to the and to the survivors uh, that loved them uh, yeah. because what you're doing is you're not allowing actual justice to be served you're not allowing the actual facts to be known you're concocting stories in pursuit of, a, of an agenda a murderous agenda and you're using the deaths of those innocent people hundreds of israeli civilians were murdered that day and by making up stories or saying oh this this thing happened to this woman and then her family says oh no actually that's that's not true at all when you do that 
It's like spitting on the graves of the dead. It's it's disgusting that you do that in pursuit of killing other people too. So and 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 but yet this is the politics of the day. This is how Israel is rolling now. Yeah. The the uh instilling fears in the heart of the diaspora is of course beneficial for Benjamin Netanyahu because that's how he can reinforce the narrative that like Jews are safe nowhere around the world except for Israel when ironically many American Jews have said this throughout history that like no they're way less safe in Israel than they are in the United States of America and part of that of course is because of the actions of Israel and the deliberate attempt to conflate from Zionists the actions of Israel with the entirety of the religion of, of Judaism. So it's this never-ending cycle of uh, consistently increasing tensions. And when you have someone like Joe Biden championing that because of his own ideological background, because of his own personal opinions, saying something, in my opinion, as gross as, without Israel, Jews would not be safe anywhere around the world, when you are the president of the United States of America, a country that has almost the same number of Jewish citizens as the nation state of Israel. Like there's what, 6 million Jews in America and I believe almost uh, 6.9 million, 7 million Jews in the state of Israel. And then the president of like the largest Jewish diaspora on the planet is saying such an insane statement. I mean, it's, it's, it's gross. It's ridiculous. Yeah. You're saying it's an abdication of your responsibility to American citizens. Yeah. And, and, you know, look, I mean, look what was happening to Netanyahu right before all of this happened. I mean, he was in, um, he was in a fight for his political life. Um, you know, there were massive protests against him. He had, he had done all this shenanigans with the court system in Israel. And I think there's really, uh, there, there's really going to end up being a scandalous narrative that will emerge about the so-called intelligence failures in Israel leading up to the Hamas attack. And it's completely legitimate to raise the issue of Netanyahu's role in um, in facilitating the pipeline of money from Qatar to Hamas. You know, and, and at least going back to 2012, we know that Netanyahu was advocating for a position of bolstering rather than weakening um, Hamas's political power within Gaza. I'm not saying I have any evidence, nor am I suggesting that, you know, this is some false flag or that Netanyahu wanted this to happen. But there's a very serious course of uh, inquiry that that I think is going to take place in Israel about exactly uh, who knew what and when. Um, also, in the way that the uh, Israeli forces uh, were slow to respond to some of the um, attacks led by Hamas and Palestinian Islamic Jihad. And then, you know, as I said at the beginning, the public in Israel has a right to know how many Israelis were killed that day by their own forces. How many of the people that were burned uh, were killed as a result of Israeli munitions fired? What kinds of efforts were actually made to resolve the hostage crisis as it existed um, at the kibbutzes that day versus, um, you know, shelling um, or or bombing? Uh, I, I, I think that it's respect uh, to the dead to... Uh, ascertain all of the facts. And at the end of the day, I don't think Netanyahu is going to look good at any of this if there's yeah. an actual inquiry. And there are good journalists in Israel. We shouldn't paint it with a model. I read the Israeli press like, you know, every single day, all day long. I'm yeah, checking Plus the Israeli 970 press. magazine uh, okay. is is uh, for it, it, people in my chat know Plus 970 for uh, their work on uh, the artificial I, intelligence program yeah. called Gospel and like Israel's targeting or Plus 972, sorry, not 970 yeah. magazine is uh, they, they're great. Uh, obviously, like even in Haaretz, you have uh, Gideon Levi and, and many others. But like also Haaretz's, Haaretz's um, defense correspondence. I mean, it's sort of like when you're reading the New York Times. The New York Times does have some really good journalists. Yeah. There's no question about it. Um, I, I know some of them. I've been with them. I mean, there's there are really good, and the same is true of Washington Post and Wall Street Journal, but you have to, yeah. you have to really study how to read these papers. Yeah. You have to learn what happens when the stories get edited. And once you, once you put on the right kind of glasses to read the New York Times, you... You, you, you read it in a different way and you can actually learn a lot. You can understand a lot about the nature of power. You can understand when you're being fed BS versus something that actually is real information. Um, you get to know which journalists are reliable and, and clearly are fighting a battle internally to get their stuff printed. The same is true of Haaretz and other Israeli media outlets. Once you, you, you understand sort of the rules that they're operating under, it's, it's really enriching to read those publications because often you're, you're getting a sense of, of what's happening at the highest levels of power. And that's something that people like you and I don't have access to. So I actually think that 
you know, we all have to learn to be students of these media outlets, uh, whether we like it or not, because they're conduits for the views of the powerful. And you have to understand how the powerful think and operate. Uh, it's why it's why everyone should read the financial press. You have yeah. to understand how these people operate, what their priorities are, what the rules of the game are that they're playing, because it's it, w- without it, you're missing an entire piece of the puzzle that's going to make your understanding flawed. Yeah, you know, you're describing media literacy that I I, I go through every single day because I people come in here and ask me like, well, what do we do? Like you say, the New York Times is biased. And I always try to tell people like, just like any state outlet, any state media, there are biases within the New York Times, even if it's not a state-owned uh, operation. Uh, so for example, when it comes to foreign policy or when it comes to whichever journalist is uh, conducting uh, their, their uh, you know, is writing the, the pieces. Like, for example, um, I forget who wrote it, but like there was an editorial opinion piece in the New York Times about uh, going back into Afghanistan and everybody got really mad about it. And actually the the point being made by the person writing the article was entirely at odds with the actual title of the article, which was written in a very incendiary way. That's one thing that most people don't know. In the editorial side of things in the New York Times, you're going to have access to a, a, a variety of different opinions but the headlines are being written by editors and they have a very different interest than the person writing the editorial uh, piece. So that's something- I mean, well, I, had a, I had a terrible thing happen once when I was at the Nation magazine where I wrote like this really serious investigative piece. This was back in the days of Blackwater Mercenaries and it was supposed to be on the cover. And then, and I, it was about like these, these four guys that had gotten killed and I had worked with their families and they were like, it was a really important article I had done for them. And then the Nation, it was supposed to be the cover. And then the Nation at the last minute puts a- Alfred E. Newman uh, sitting on the toilet looking like George W. Bush on the cover of the Nation magazine. Oh, God. And it was like, I, I, I hit the roof. Well, no, because it was like, I wanted to send this to the families because it meant a lot to them. And anyway, the point just being, all kinds of stuff happens in editorial processes. And, you know, you 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 got to be, you got to, you really, if you're a serious person, you have to learn how to read the paper. And it doesn't yeah. just mean comprehend the words. It means you have to study the politics of the paper, look for patterns, because it actually is worthwhile. I've never been a fan of like, oh, I don't read the New York Times. I, really, I, I almost can't watch CNN anymore. I mean, I try to sometimes, but I, I will always read the establishment newspapers because yeah. you have, you. I mean, if you don't do that, you... you it, this is a very serious error on people's part. You have to understand how the powerful think, and that's where they yeah. do their talk. This is actually what I wanted to point to. Oh, that now I remember. So one thing that you brought up about like uh, a variety of different outlets and like an access to what's going on on the ground with like social media, TikTok in particular, both on the Israeli side of them, like very openly IDF social, very openly documenting Telegram, the atrocious yeah. things that they're doing, but also on Telegram uh, with like uh, posts coming directly from the al Qassam brigades and also from Palestinians on the ground who are showcasing like the atrocities that they're subjected to. This has been phenomenal in breaking through the otherwise dominant narrative and that's why you see a massive difference in uh, age demographics in the way that they perceive Israel's actions to be permissible or not. People that have incorporated social media into their media diets actually do have a very different opinion than those who do not get that as a primary source. However, there's also the negative side of that too because I feel like that's how you arrive at a lot of charlatans as well. People who take yeah, advantage yeah, of that. Sure. People who take advantage of the lack of of trust in mainstream media because like you and I both understand how important it is to still read the New York Times and to still recognize that there's like good journalism also happening at these mainstream outlets every now and then or even if it's a biased piece there's still I guess like some semblance of the truth that you see uh, within that whereas the more yeah. uh, the the legacy publishers operate as a mouthpiece for the State Department the less people trust it and that creates an opportunity for a, a tremendous amount of misinformation from those who claim to be the arbiters, the real arbiters of the truth. And that's how you arrive at like, you know, the, the insane anti-Semitic conspiracies from, uh, yeah, yeah. from people. And that's how you arrive at like anti-Semitism increasing. And that's how you arrive at like QAnon stuff. Right. But you know that this is also why, you know, I mean, I, so I have, I'm in the telegram channels of, uh, of a variety of Islamic resistance groups, including the, uh, Al Qasim brigades. So I follow all of their, they're very, very active. Um, they, you know, you have to follow them through, uh, mirror channels because they keep getting shut down, but you know, I'm, I'm monitoring, um, the communications from Hezbollah, from the Houthis, from Hamas. 
And sometimes like I'll be somewhere like in a restaurant and like, you know, it'll pop up on my phone, an alert will pop up that the Qasem brigades have just posted a video. So I'll get into conversations sort of with, you know, normies, as you said earlier. And what I say to people is like, we're being told that these guys are like the second coming of the Nazis, um, you know, and that they're like ISIS. They're the worst, you know, butchers in the world. They're eating children's body parts, et cetera. Don't you think it would behoove you to sort of fact check that, like look into it, understand what is their perspective? If you're not monitoring as a journalist, if you're not monitoring what Hamas is saying, if you're not following their media channels, if you're not following the videos that they're releasing, often Hamas will release a video showing an attack. And then two days later, Israel will acknowledge that nine soldiers got killed here. And it turns out that we already knew that two days ago because Hamas posted the video of them killing them. This isn't supporting Hamas. This is doing basic diligence because we're yeah. dealing with a, na a nuclear armed nation state that is a pathological liar. And and so, you know, not, not to get cliche, but this is exactly the kind of stuff Malcolm X is talking about when he talks about, you know, the m manipulation and, and, have, and letting the other people tell you who the enemy is. And when it comes to Hamas, I find it extremely important to actually have a factual understanding of exactly who they are and what they do. And Absolutely. you know, I'm not a moral arbiter of anything. I'm here as a journalist. And what often happens is that the Israelis will say something and when you actually just scratch the surface a bit, you realize it's not exactly what you're saying. And and I'll tell you this, I mean, watching Hamas's channels is extremely revealing when it comes to what is happening on the ground with the Israeli military forces inside of Gaza. And it helps you to understand, it's going to help you to understand when Israel does not end this by tying a neat little ribbon of defeating Hamas, because it's not going well for Israel. And you only know that if you separate your, if you cut the umbilical cord from the Israeli propaganda machine that is being reinforced by the Biden administration. So yeah. this isn't a pro-Hamas pro anything. This is a pro-fact thing. I'm very clear that what Hamas, that many of the things that Hamas did on October 7th, particularly towards civilians, those are war crimes. There should be accountability for that. You don't kidnap children. Absolutely. You don't kidnap the elderly. You don't shoot families in their beds. You know, it, it doesn't matter if those people were occupation settlers or whatever. Many of the people that got killed at those kibbutzes, you know, were sort of lefty types and whatever. Do they yeah. have a right to be living on Palestinian land? No, they absolutely do not have a right to be living on Palestinian land. Does it mean that then they need to be murdered in their rooms? No, it doesn't need, mean they need to be murdered in their rooms. At the same time, no one's going to bully me into saying that there wasn't some uh, legal framework for what Hamas did at military bases that day, or that, you know, the, or, or get me to, to, to say, well, Israel had some right of self-defense to go in and then murder upwards of 30,000 people, a vast majority of whom are civilians. Like, these are just facts, you know, and, and people try to bully you. If you, if you dare to sort of say, let me, let me try to understand what these people I'm being told are like the new Nazis. Let me try to understand a little bit about them. Like, isn't that or responsible? ISIS. Or, or, or they're, they're like anybody. barbaric. They're like a colonizing force akin to like ISIS, which is, uh, yeah. obviously well, they call them Hamas ISIS. Yeah. Right. Which is well, hilarious because like Israel in both it's like association of, of like in, in its actions being uh settler colonial violence or colonial violence over an occupied uh, group of individuals, uh, occupied population. And also it's association with that violence, with religion, a false association with religion, because they are the ones oftentimes that conflate it with Judaism is way closer to ISIS than than uh, Hamas being a resistance group against a uh, occupying power. So and and also obviously Israel has in the past collaborated with ISIS type Salafist militant groups, Al Nusra and the like. So like it, whereas uh, uh, while there are, uh, as far as I understand, ISIS militants inside of Gaza too, every now and then, Hamas does not want ISIS to be inside of Gaza. They don't want. They want to be the only game in town. So they have executed uh, uh, ISIS militants inside of Gaza in the past. So it's it, not it's, just that it's, it's I mean, they, well, that's true what you're saying, but it's not just that um, it's it's also that there is a distinct national identity to the Palestinian resistance and the notion that you're going to have, you know, the, you know, these other forces 
coming in and hijacking what is ultimately a national liberation struggle. I mean, that that is what pal that's what Palestinians have been engaged in for 76 years. They've been engaged in a national liberation struggle. And because, you know, we all now it's the power of nightmares. Ooh, spooky Islamic resistance. Uh, it, it, if Catholicism was demonized in the same way, then it would have been the same narrative about the, the you know, the IRA, you know, in Ireland. Yeah. And there's there isn't compatibility between ISIS and the Palestinian resistance because the Palestinian resistance is a distinctly national liberation movement. It's just true. Yeah. You know, and, that's, and, actually, and, it, and it falls apart like the, the arguments fall apart so quickly because like if you consistently make your enemy look like a barbaric monster that has no real interest in like emancipation or anything of that matter and they're just simply operating on anti-semitism and like the hate their hatred for jewish people which is or, or even like how much they love hitler they're always like oh look at isis we found i mean not isis look at hamas yeah. we found like another uh, copy of mein kampf in arabic that's yeah. annotated over and over again now when i look at that i find it very hilarious because like that is such a classic western focused version of propaganda they're trying to conduct an argument as though like this is campus anti-semitism like they they went to a jewish fraternity and uh, painted a, a swastika on the side of it like that's not what hamas is doing at all but they're trying to yeah. americanize or they're trying to get the the western world to understand it it's like listen the idea that like palestinians are operating on the on the basis of anti-semitism and not on uh the fact that like israel is blowing up their population and has been a belligerent occupier for at least since 1967 and even before that obviously with the nakba and that you know it's being conducted by those who say that they're doing it uh, at the best of judaism like they don't need mein kampf to learn about anti-semitism in the same way that like some midwestern kid would in america to the, when they get radicalized online or whatever, right? Like that's so stupid. I mean, can you can you imagine? You know, just to Im imagine what it's like to to grow up in Gaza. You know, I mean, I, I mean, but seriously, people should really, really think about this. Imagine what your human existence would be like if you you grow up in air in an area, a country basically that is the more or less the size of Philadelphia, and you're trapped in what is essentially an open air prison, and you have uh, a foreign uh, uh, occupying power that is in full control of every aspect of your life, whether there is water, whether there is food, uh, whether the fishermen are allowed to go a certain uh, distance off the shore. You're you're growing up in this uh, in this sort of cage, basically, and. Palestinians in Gaza are some of the most well-educated people in the world. You know, Israel systematically destroyed its universities, killed its academics, its poets, its storytellers. But it's like, what what happens to the psychology of human beings? What do what does the world expect anyway? Is is going to happen? It's a miracle. It's a miracle that the people of Gaza are the way they are. It's a miracle that they're so res resilient. I mean, yeah. look at look at how right now. Most Palestinians are living in conditions where they have one toilet for every 480 people. That's that's what most people are. Think of how many Americans gripe about their kids taking too long in the bathroom. Imagine having to live in conditions where you are breastfeeding a baby and you have to make a choice between drinking salt water that's going to make you ill or contaminated water that's going to make you ill. You have women with newborn babies who can't lactate and so they're using formula and they don't have clean water to mix the formula powder. So they're having to try to decide which kind of contaminated water should I use to breastfeed my baby. The just one moment of anyone's day, you should just stop, read something about what the conditions were like even on October 6th in Gaza and ask yourself, how would I look my children in the face? How would I look my friends in the face? What would my life be like? Would I be pursuing a PhD? Would, would I be going to university? Would I be online trying to educate the rest of the world? What kind of person would you be? It's incredible that the people of Gaza are as resilient, that you see so many articulate children. This nine-year-old girl who did an interview with Wael Daudou, the, the, the bureau chief Al for Al Jazeera Arab, Arab yeah. who wants to be a, you know, I, I posted this video of her on Twitter. And then like two days later, Wael and his, you know, and his cameraman get hit by, you know, an Israeli drone strike when they're reporting on a previous strike at a hospital. But it's like this little girl was incredible. So many children that you see that are, you know, videos of them coming out of Gaza, 
these are these are wonderful, beautiful human beings without any context. But then when you understand how they grew up, and then the Israelis are like, oh, look, we found Mein Kampf here. Oh, look, this girl has a screensaver on her iPad uh, of Hitler's of face. Hitler, that was one yeah. of the things that they did. And it's like, what's next to Trump's bed? Trump had a cop. What did it, wasn't it Trump's? One of his family members said Trump had Mein Kampf next to his bed. I mean, but it's again, like. It's just. It's just so ridiculous and so obviously propaganda. And it's propaganda that I like to look at and see who the target audience is. And it's so glaringly obvious that it's a Western facing propaganda to like make this association with Hitler and make this association with like German European anti Semitism as though like I mean, I'm not gonna say that there isn't anti Semitism in the in the Arab world or in the Muslim world in general. Of course there not, are. Of course there's anti Semitism there all course. over the place. It's, of course yeah. there's anti Semitism uh in the in the Muslim world as well. But it's like where that anti Semitism comes from, where it's born out of is like entirely different in many cases. And I think the only reason why you would try to make that argument is specifically to get like the European minds that comprehend it as like, oh, these are bad guys. Like they're bad guys because they they like Adolf Hitler. And it's like, I don't think that's the case at all for many Palestinians. They are- But you look at- They are surprisingly yeah. open-minded about uh, Israeli people and Jewish people. Rafat, who uh, rest in yeah. power, was assassinated by the state of Israel after I believe Barry Weiss and numerous other American reporters had like criticized him for engaging in a little bit of gallows humor as uh, you know Israel was ethnically cleansing uh, his his uh, entire city. He talked about how uh, originally until like I guess he was like 25 or 26 or something that he had never like had never met a, a Jewish person and beyond that everything he knew about Jewish people was Israel. And that he thought that, like, Jewish people just despised all Palestinians across the board. And that, like, they just wanted to kill all Palestinians across the board. And then he had changed his percep uh, perception when he realized, like, oh, my God, they're, like, actually, you know, Israeli citizens even. Uh, Israeli Jewish citizens that are are out there advocating for uh, Palestinians against their own country. And I think, like, this is something that we can't comprehend in America because uh, it's impossible for us to comprehend it. We have no way of contextualizing that level of violence. Uh, we only see it in TV as, like, either uh, entire city blocks reduced to rubble in, like, whether it be Syria or Iraq, in the hands of, like, American soldiers or, like, civil war or something of that sort. We don't have any way of, uh, of recognizing that uh, these are real human beings and not, like, uh, something that's different, something that's been dehumanized systematically through mainstream media as a consequence of America's um, objectives in the Middle East. I mean, you know, as someone who's traveled a lot in countries that have been on the, you know, I've been in a lot of places where you're on the other side of the barrel of the gun, you know, of American foreign policy. And I was always struck, whether it was Iraq or Afghanistan or Yemen or Somalia, at how um, so many people who had every reason to want to kill me drew a distinction. Um, and I heard it so many times. It was almost like someone had given a script. That's how consistent it was in countries across the world where people would say, I know you're not your government. And I would be the one saying to them, no, I'm also complicit in this. I think we've been fed a, an enormous barrel of lies our whole lives. Um, and the, it, it's necessary to dehumanize the enemy. That's the first step of uh, justifying the unjustifiable. And it's a tactic as old as time. And it's not that there aren't sick, twisted bastards, uh, you know, operating um, in, in a variety of groups, including Hamas. That's, you know, that's true. There's also sick, twisted bastards operating in the United States military. And I yeah. think that the, the mistake we all make is allowing ourselves to get pressured, bullied, cajoled into um, cowering before those characterizations. Um, people should do their own thinking. That's what journalists should be in the business of anyway. And, you know, uh, my my general instinct as a reporter and as a journalist for uh, going on three decades now has been that when I'm told by the powerful who my enemy is, 
I want to go talk to those people because I don't view myself as just thinking for myself. I try to give people information that they can use to make informed decisions on what they support or oppose or other things. And I try to be very transparent. Clearly, I'm not a guy that just believes in, he said this and the other person said this. I don't don't believe in the corporate media defined terms of objectivity. But the hardest part of keeping your spine is when you're told those people are vicious animals who kill for pleasure. Having the the bravery or the principle to be able to say, I'm going to check that fact. Um, yeah. and that's what all of us should be doing uh, in the face it's, it's of the It's the bare minimum. Of yeah, it, no, it's no the one bare should be winning an award for doing that. That should just be basic journalism. Yes. But look at the bullying about it, though. If you dare to say, hey, let's look at this from the perspective of Hamas, uh, which I think is a totally legitimate line of inquiry and pursuit. Yeah. Uh, because so, but that's controversial. Um, and, you know, we're not supposed to do that. Why are you, why, you know, I wrote a piece the other day, you know, where I, where I, I talked about how none of this is going to actually crush the armed resistance in Palestine. I got so many emails and co- communications from people calling me an anti-Semite. Oh, you're pro Hamas. Why don't you have your cafe on? Nah, 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 nah. You know, grow up. You no, know, it, you, you, that's, that's you the know, point. Like, exactly. But there's a deliberate, there's a real reason for why, uh, it, it's, um, intellectual curiosity in this situation that is an absolute first step in objective journalism is a necessity and is oftentimes stopped at every step of the way. It's so that you can manufacture consent. If you listen to what the demands are, why here, I'll give you an example of, of, uh, Ansar Allah, right? The Houthis in Yemen since day one, since October 8th, October 9th, Ansar Allah has very openly stated what their goals are. That they are not simply just uh, operating on anti-Semitism or anger towards Jewish people or, or uh, some other process, even though you know their, their logo does uh, have some anti-Semitic stuff in it. Regardless, they have said Israel's actions constitute ethnic cleansing and Israel has to stop ethnically cleansing Palestinians in Gaza. They have to stop this siege immediately. If the siege doesn't stop, they are going to ensure that not a single ship passes through the Red Sea. And yet you never hear that perspective in mainstream media. The way that the 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 actions of the Houthis are represented in Western media is as though they are mindless drones attacking commerce, attacking, uh, uh, you know, attacking ships for no reason. They're pirates that have no no actual interest or actual reason for behaving in the way that they're behaving and that they're uh, an Iranian proxy that's just mindless and attacking uh, all these ships because they hate uh, Jewish people. And beyond that, none of their actions have been harmful to like the actual person, like an actual human being so far, as far as like their takeovers of the ships and as far as very successfully uh, routing traffic away from the Red Sea. It's just simply a blockade. This is exactly how America would uh, implement a blockade if it needed to, even though I don't think people would probably go against America's uh, uh, demands and it would never even get to that point, but that's precisely how they would enforce a blockade. And for some reason, America's actions against this halting of commerce, right? Or at least like making it more costly to ship uh, the, on, on normal routes through the Red Sea is infinitely more violent and worse than anything Israel has done so far. And I sit here and I watch that and I lose my mind. Like America has killed more uh, people, like more Yemeni people than they have uh, done anything towards Israel, than they've ever like even criticized Israel. They've killed, the CENTCOM, I believe, uh, uh, killed 10 uh, Houthis. And now they're talking about possibly like blowing up Yemen again. And I mean, these guys have already survived. They withstood an uh, American-backed genocide already. So I I think they have this perspective where they uh, look at it and they're like, You've done the worst to us. Uh, what more can you do, right? And it is mind-boggling to me that there is not better coverage on this issue because, God forbid, if you do actually treat the Houthis as, like, rational actors, even if you don't agree with their uh, perspective or whatever, if you just treat them as, like, rational actors in the situation, God forbid, more people might say, well, you know, I want to do BDS. I, I want to boycott Israel until it stops. Uh, yeah, and you know, violence. Naomi Naomi Klein wrote a good piece uh, in the Guardian this week about that. It was like the 15th anniversary of her writing, ad- advocating for BDS boycott, divest, sanction, and she was just writing about what you know the her, the basis of her piece in the Guardian was basically you know what if the world had listened you know 15 years ago on this issue. Um, one thing I wanted to mention though in the context, I haven't seen anyone bring this up about the 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 Houthi blockade. Do you remember back in 2010 when 
these peace activists organized a humanitarian flotilla uh, to try to break. Oh, the siege Mon, of Gaza. Yeah. Yeah. So I think it's a really irrelevant. I think it's a very relevant point to raise in the context of this. Let's how did Israel respond to, a, you know, an effort to affect uh, the, the waters around Gaza when peace activists bringing in humanitarian supplies? Largely, it was a symbolic gesture to try to break the blockade of Gaza. The Israelis storm the ship and they end up killing nine people. Israeli commandos go onto the ship and they end up killing you know, nine people. They didn't find a single weapon on board. They didn't find a single piece of military yeah. anything. It was exactly what the activists had said. And you know who the person that then in the United States deploys to meet the press and other shows to defend Israel's killing of these activists? It was Joe Biden at the time who did that. And it's like, you know, the, the, what, what the Yemenis are doing uh, with this blockade is an incredibly creative response for a largely powerless state. You know, Yemen doesn't have the capacity to fight Israel militarily. It doesn't, you know, it's, although yeah, Yemenis sent more people to fight the jihad in Afghanistan against the Soviet Union than any other country in the Arab world. I mean, Yemen is is off the charts surreal country. It's one of the most amazing yeah. places I've ever been. I actually love Yemen. It's an incredible country. But what I'm saying is, in the context of all the Arab-Israeli wars, in the context of everything that's taken place since the 1948 Nakba and the, the beginning of all of this for the Palestinians, you've just had failure after failure after failure to defend the Palestinian people. Uh, and, and the solidarity has been utterly lacking, um, you know, particularly from Arab states. For Yemen, regardless of what anyone thinks of the Houthis about you know, any of that, but for Yemen in particular, to have found some creative intervention to participate in this is an extraordinary piece of history that we're watching unfold. And the fact that that tiny nation has caused the Goliaths of the world to, to deploy to surround Yemen, it's extraordinary. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's an extraordinary thing that is, is happening. And the reaction of the United States and Britain and all of these other powerful nations, it's something to behold. You know, it actually shows a great fear on the part of the empire rather than, you know, anything it says about Yemen. It's it's really extraordinary thing that we're watching. Absolutely. Um, the thing I was going to say about Mavi Maramona, here's an interesting thing. I'm Turkish. Um, I, I don't know if you knew that or not, but I, I grew up in Turkey. Uh, Recep Tayyip Erdogan very famously was super critical of Israel after that, but it's all theatrics. We just talked about how much of return on investment that the Houthis got, the Ansar Allah got, from implementing a blockade. You know which country has so much power to genuinely economically cripple the state of Israel? Turkey, as a matter of fact. Because uh, I believe uh, approximately 40% of all energy that goes into Israel passes through Turkey, from Azerbaijan to Turkey, through Turkish pipes, directly into Israel. They, they uh, Something along the lines of like... Uh, Something along the lines of like 40 to 50, maybe 60% of the steel that Israel Israel uses comes directly from Turkey as well. Recep Tayyip Erdogan's own son was still, while Recep Tayyip Erdogan is engaging in all this political theater, talking about, you know, Israel, your time is over. Uh, yeah, Nathan, yeah. Netanyahu, more like Satan Yahoo, whatever, you know, yeah. whatever he's doing every day. He... Is uh, simultaneously has his son actually engaging in commerce in Israel with his own ships, and mm. and uh, this is a fact that he has tried to. But is this uh, ongoing now? Yeah, is this ongoing since, since the Gaza siege yes. began? Yes, one hundred thousand percent, absolutely. So much so that he tried to forcibly suppress a news story that covered his son's dealings with Israel and the and the shipping uh, deal that his son has with Israel in Turkey like last a uh, couple weeks ago. Anything that Recep Tayyip Erdogan says, for example, uh, about Israel, sure, optically speaking, it's important for a regional leader to go out and like, you know, criticize uh, Israel's actions, certainly. But the idea that like real politics is happening of that sort, where like Erdogan is simply powerless and the only thing he could do is uh, criticize sure. Israel... Let me ask you, spoken word is, is bullshit. So is your is your sense uh, not to turn this into my show where I interview you, but um, is it your sense that if Turkey and Erdogan wanted to actually take a, um, a a concrete, meaningful step toward opposing this, your 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 argument is that they if they joined in the blockade or they also 
implemented similar measures that it would uh, have, a, have an immediate and direct impact on Israel? One million percent. Absolutely. Yeah, of course. Has, has it, Erdogan been asked about this at all in public, uh, no. why he doesn't do it? Of course not. Uh, there well, is, I know uh, he wouldn't be asked that in Turkey, but if he was at an international uh, conference, it would be an I interesting believe, question for a journalist to I, ask. I, I don't believe he has. I, I don't believe he's ever been asked that at all, including his, his son's own personal dealings with Israel. Here, I'll pull the, I'll pull the information up about the, the shipping. Yeah, I mean, you can shoot I it to me later. I'm, I'm actually, I'm, journalistically, I'm interested in this because it's, it's an interesting story. Yeah, this was... Um, this was one of the things that I thought was very interesting that like uh, Turkey has what uh, the, the Turkish statements originally, as a matter of fact, there's another interesting political thing here in Turkey that like uh, there's a lot of anti-Arab sentiment in Turkey uh, yeah. because from even like liberal now uh, newly formed ultra nationalist coalitions. And originally even Erdogan's statements were like kind of wishy-washy on Palestine, on Gaza in the immediate mm -hmm. aftermath of October 7. And then there was a course correction done in Turkey because of the overwhelming popular support from the population, both ironically from the more Islamist side of the Turkish population, and also even like actual uh, leftists like communists and whatnot that were, uh, you, you saw flags of the PFLP and DFLP in Turkey alongside the flags of like Islamic Jihad uh, being waved at the same time. It was like a very weird situation. But uh, ultimately, Erdogan retriangulated his message because he is a uh, populist uh, quite similar to uh, Donald Trump in many ways. And, and has yeah, been I'll, I'll, super critical I'll, I'll, of Israel. It, it's really, um, I mean, it's really interesting because I, I have a kind of sub-interest in sort of monitoring how various Arab states are approaching this. I thought it was interesting that Saudi Arabia signed on to South Africa's uh, genocide suit um, yeah. at the ICJ. Um, you know, when they're not butchering, you know, journalists in their consulate, they're, uh, you know, uh, they're doing the right thing, it appears. But um uh, I, I think it's very, it's, it's interesting what's happening in Jordan, what's happening in Lebanon, um, Egypt, but, you know, Turkey, as, as you're certainly more familiar with than I am, I mean, under Erdogan, there's been a very interesting shift in how Turkey has engaged in East Africa, um, in Somalia and elsewhere. Oh, in Somalia, yeah. But also the, the sort of, you know, he fancies himself this sort of bridge between Europe and the Middle East. And, um, and I, I, I think it's really, it's, it's what you're saying is really interesting because that form of hypocrisy is particularly noteworthy. Uh, when you're go when you're going so far um, in rhetoric as Erdogan has on Netanyahu and his conduct to the point where some German politicians are suggesting <laughs> that Erdogan shouldn't even be allowed into Germany anymore because he violated their laws on anti-Semitic speech. That's that's actually been raised. It's quite interesting to note that he could take what is effectively a non-military uh, response to this that is more akin to sanctions and is refusing to do so and that his son is benefiting off of the continuation of uh, of these yeah. routes. It's a, it's a, I definitely want to look into it. It's a very interesting well, story. Yeah, I mean, but that's just that's just how Turkey operates. Only NATO yeah, nations yeah, attack true. other NATO that nations. True, it, yes, that may be yeah. true, but uh, you know, what's old is new when situations like this uh, yeah. unfold. I mean, it becomes... Same. You know, history becomes very relevant in moments like this. Yeah, same with same with like uh, being the primary uh, uh, creator of the Bayraktars, right? The the UAV drones that were shipped to Ukraine while simultaneously cutting energy deals with Russia. On the, I mean, if Israel itself has done this with uh, with uh, respect to Ukraine and 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 Russia as well uh, because of their own uh, relationship with both of those countries. But uh, yeah, no, Recep Tayyip Erdogan is very famous for being like super aggro when it comes to political theater while simultaneously conducting his affairs behind closed doors in the same ways. When push comes to shove, when it's material interest, Erdogan is always going to be a loyal servant to Western interests. And that has been proven time and time again. And that's precisely, that is precisely why he is allowed to operate in the way that he wants to in the northern Syrian corridor as a NATO power because America gives Erdogan the permission to do whatever he, uh, he wants in the northern Syrian corridor because I think America ultimately understands that no matter what Erdogan says in public, what he is going to do is still do the bidding of the Western world in many respects. Interesting, man. I have to I have to hit you up about some more of that and get details on it. It's very, very yeah, cool. Yeah, I sent it's you a couple articles on Azerbaijan. 
which, by the way, of course, Israel gave weapons to when it was uh, operating in, yep. in uh, Karabakh. In nagorno Karabakh. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. Right. Well, that, that does it for two hours. Wait, you can, know, you, so. can, you, can you explain to me just a couple of very quick things about the lingo of your, uh, of your crowd there? What's this Kaya Kaya uh, thing? Can you tell me some of this stuff? Okay. So Kaya is my dog. She's sleeping right now. I don't want to wake her up. People told me not to look at your are... chat, but I peeked at it a little bit. And can you just well, can you just give me like a couple highlights of what goes on? Because mostly I've just been looking at you. So so here's here's how this works. Uh, right next to me, if you go on the stream, if you watch the stream and see the chat, you'll you'll see that there's like emotes, but you don't have the the proper programs, like the proper apps, like BTTV and FFZ and stuff to see those yeah. emotes. So you just see the code basically. So you, when you look at it, you okay. probably see Kaya. PLS, right? That's actually a dancing puppy, animated dancing puppy. So there's, it's like hieroglyphs. Uh, Twitch culture is very interesting. We use a lot of, uh, we use a lot of emotes. Okay, basically. I got it. I'm looking. Um, so yeah, what you see is probably just the word. Uh, what you see probably just the word Kaya PLS, but on my screen and on everybody else's screen, they actually see uh, a dancing Holy puppy. Moses. Look at these people. Like I'm. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, there's some things I wish I didn't see, but um, wow. I'm just looking through your chat here. This is who are yeah, who like are people, all these pe people. Like, like normies, normies think like, for example, like Pepe the Frog is like an alt right symbol, but like it has been used in on this side of the internet uh, in a completely apolitical way in perpetuity since the beginning. Wow. No, I'm just now I'm reading some of the uh, uh, I'm reading some of the comments here, even though I was told not to. And um, wow, what a hodgepodge of things like interesting yeah. crowd of people you have. Yeah, I don't mean to do a, a crash course on this. I'm just I've never been on something like this before. Yeah, there's uh, Very, currently really 23,000 people this entire time that's been listening to us talk. Uh, wow. Thank you, everyone, for stadium spending this time. I mean, I really for a while just thought it was you and I shooting the sh But um, it's uh Wow, it's really it's it's really interesting. I appreciate the opportunity also to probably talk to a lot of people who never have heard of my work or anything like that. Um, yeah, these guys might be yeah. a little young to to know of uh, you know some of the no, things no, I mean, cool. they brought up. Yeah, yeah, but but I, it's all good. I mean, I actually um, you know I talk a lot at uh, at universities, and I you know I really um, I, I have a lot of respect for uh, for the younger generation. I mean, it's. It's strange when you realize that's not you anymore. Uh, you know, when your hair starts to get gray and stuff like that. But I actually, I'm, I'm coming um, up on that. I'm 32, so I'm, I'm uh, starting you, to notice you, that as you, well. I mean, I'm, my my beard is starting to gray. All right. Well, you're you know you you still got some good years in you, but um, <laughs> but no, but thanks thanks a lot for having me on, and um, also for all those people for hanging out and um. Yeah, and listening. All right, well, thank you. Thank you so much for coming on, Jeremy. This was a phenomenal, phenomenal opportunity, and I look forward to having you on in the future, hopefully under better circumstances. Yeah, anytime, and thanks again to you and to your whole crew. It sounds like, just from reading the comments, it sounds like uh, you often do a lot of interacting with, uh, with, your, uh, with your community there, which is a cool thing. And, oh, yeah. Um, well, my apologies for sucking up all the time. I'm sure there were a lot of people. No, no, to, no, not at all. This was through. really, really good. All yeah. right, cool. Anytime, man. Happy all to right. come back. All right, bye. All right, take care. How do I disconnect? I got it. I'll, I'll do it. <laughs> all right, that was Jeremy Scale of The Intercept. Ladies and gentlemen, the GOAT, uh, legendary reporter, phenomenal guest. If you can't get enough of uh, Jeremy talking, for two hours in a row, I highly suggest this podcast as well. Um, I believe it was uh, intercepted, right? Not deconstructed. Deconstructed is with Ryan. Uh, intercepted is the is the podcast that he does. Great podcast, uh, oftentimes alongside uh, Murtaza Hussein. And um, yeah, this is a this is a real journalist. For those of you who don't know, a very real journalist. <laughs> one of the one of the few remaining, as a matter of fact. So we are uh, very fortunate to be able to have him on for two hours at a time. I mean, it's crazy.